Amir, thank you very much. I'm delighted to be here. Really appreciate the invitation. I'm going to give a brief overview of sort of the state of using costs and guidelines in the United States. It's kind of humbling to talk about this here in the UK with all of you from NICE. We're not anywhere in the same ballpark, as you probably know, but we'll talk more about that. So I have no financial disclosures, as Amir said. Back in the good old days, I got to work with him at the ACP, and now I'm on the uh, U.S. Preventive Services Task Force. These views are mine. I'm not speaking for the task force or the government. So why think about costs and guidelines? And you've heard a lot about that already. Um, but guidelines have the, uh, um, the ability to um, sort of direct very large-scale expenditures. I'm going to give you some examples from the United States. Mammography, for example, in the United States, um, estimates are about $8 billion in expenditures. Some estimates are north of $10 billion, depending on how often you screen. Lung cancer screening, $1.3 to $2 billion. Um, HIV pre-exposure pre prophylaxis, so that's giving people who are at high risk for HIV a medication uh, to, to reduce their chance of, uh, of acquiring HIV, um, and work that we did looking at the cost effectiveness of that to provide um, PrEP for 25% of people who, in, uh, who are injecting drugs in the U.S. would cost about $45 billion over the next 20 years. So very, very large resource ex uh, expenditures potentially from guidelines. So why think about costs? Well, of course, the notion is you might be able to promote high-value care if you include this in your guidelines. Some stakeholders uh, may want this information. And then, of course, low-value care uh, doesn't really help with outcomes and um, doesn't significantly improve and may have opportunity costs. In the United States, though, there are a number of challenges, and I'm going to separate them into sort of practical challenges and more scientific challenges. Distinction's a little artificial, but first of all, there's really not very much agreement among the public in the United States about how and whether value should be used uh, and considered in making health care decisions. If you choose to do it, then there's not really that much agreement about what constitutes high-value care, and Joanne talked about this, what threshold would you use and how would you, how, how would you apply that? Uh, and there are some stakeholders who are really actually opposed to this. Um, so the scientific challenges um, you've heard a little bit about, um, first of all, high quality cost effectiveness analyses are often just not available for many of the things that you might be developing a guideline for. There really would be very little, if anything, in the literature. I think the methods for synthesizing economic analyses are not as well developed as are the, the methods for synthesizing um, studies of, about effectiveness. For example, if you have cost effectiveness analyses that get different answers, how, you, how do you reconcile those? I can just give you an example from some of our own work. We had an analysis of uh, pre-exposure prophylaxis in men who have sex with men, and we got a fairly different answer than some close and colleagues, good friends who had done a independent analysis, um, high, very high quality analysis, and despite the fact that we knew the models very well, et cetera, we spent several months trying to figure out why we were getting different answers, and it turned out to be quite challenging uh, to do that. And then costs vary dramatically in the United States between settings and over time. And uh, the, for those who don't live in the U.S., this might all seem uh, kind of strange, but it, it, it is true, and I'll just give you a personal example. Um, my daughter had a stress fracture in her foot, and, and uh, we took her in to get, uh, see a specialist about her foot, and last week we got the bill for a plain x-ray of her foot, and the bill was $1,900 U.S. dollars. Um, and, uh, we were somewhat taken aback by that. Our, our insurance paid $1,000, and our out-of-pocket was $180, so that was an $1,800 plain film of her foot, if you can imagine it. We might have gotten the same service somewhere else for $200. Um, good luck figuring out how you would do that, but it is possible. And so there's really not a single cost effectiveness because the costs vary so dramatically. They also, they also vary over time. The price of drugs goes down or up, and often in the United States, actually, the cost of drugs go up. So if you had a, a service you thought was good value, it might not be uh, next year. 
And then finally, the costs and the benefits may accrue to different people or systems. So in the U.S., with commercial health insurance, there is a great deal of churn. So you, the kind of the, the, the company insuring you now might not be the same, same insurer as you have in five years. So if I treat your hepatitis C for $50,000 or so, um, I might prevent a liver transplant 10 or 20 years later. But it's not likely that this person, that the payer that's providing the treatment is going to be the same payer that actually reaps the savings associated with preventing that liver transplant. So that creates a number of disincentives um, for thinking long term. A lot of these issues have been discussed by a number of people, including the ACA, the American College of Cardiology, the American Heart Association. Many of the, the topics that I just talked about are discussed in their position statement on using cost effectiveness and costs and guidelines. Um, and I'm going to give you now just an example of what I meant about the costs of drugs varying over time and how there's variation. This is based on some work that we did, again, on the cost effectiveness of pre-exposure prophylaxis. And on the y-axis here, you have the cost effectiveness and incremental, the incremental cost effectiveness in dollars per quality adjusted life years. And you can see the numbers. I hope you can see the numbers. It goes up pretty high. That's 450,000 at the top. And on the x-axis is the effectiveness of pre-exposure prophylaxis. So that's like, what's the likelihood that it will reduce, what, how much does it reduce your chance of being infected if, you take, if you're taking it? So if you look at about 50% effectiveness, which is what the trial suggested for um, people who inject drugs, um, at current prices, the cost effectiveness of PrEP is about $250,000 in the U.S. Um, the drug costs about $10,000 a year. Um, the cost effectiveness is roughly linear in drug price. So the bottom curve shows what happens if you reduce the drug price, drug price by 65%, and the cost effectiveness drops into the neighborhood of $100,000 per quality. So variation, of course, in, can have enormous impact. So let me now talk about how a few different groups in the United States have approached costs, or not approached costs, uh, guideline groups. The, the ACP, and Amir could tell you more about this, they have a series on high-value health care. They do use cost data and cost effectiveness when it's available, which is not that often, he tells me. Um, the Guide to the Community Preventive Services, this is a group that does uh, recommendations about public health interventions, community-based interventions. Um, they um, review cost effectiveness and make that information available. The U.S. Preventive Services Task Force, which I'm on, um, we have focused on clinical effectiveness, not cost effectiveness or economic analyses, so our focus is do things work. Two other examples, in specialty, large specialty societies, the American College of Chest Physicians has a statement endorsing the consideration of resource uses, and they do look at in, in some of their guidelines, and I'll show you an example uh, of studies um, when cost effectiveness analyses are available. The ACC, AHA is now putting value statements in some of their guidelines. That's new. It's happened over the last year or so, and I'll show you that as well. So this is from the, uh, a the ACCP. This is their guideline on lung cancer screening. I want to thank Sheena Patel, who's here. She's one of the authors for, for um, helping me find this. And this is what they say about screening for lung cancer. By most currently used standards in the U.S., low-dose computed tomography screening is considered cost-effective. Results from a systematic review that included the, from 13 studies found the cost effectiveness for LDCT screening ranged from 18,000 to about 66,000 per life year and 22,000 to 243,000 per quality adjusted life year. So this illustrates two things. One, they're reviewing this evidence, trying to present this information. But secondly, look at the variation and they, they found in terms of dollars per quality adjusted life year. And you'd have to come to grips somehow with what, that, what causes that variation and what it means. This is the American College of Cardiology. It's a recent guideline they did on prevention of sudden cardiac death. It's about the use of implantable defibrillators, which you put in to prevent sudden cardiac death. The top row, the blue and the green there, is their clinical recommendation. And it's a, it's a the CR means the class of recommendation, level one is their highest recommendation. The details are important, but what I wanted to show you is this, this statement in the middle, their value statement. And they say that um, a, a transvenous ICD provides intermediate value in the secondary prevention of sudden cardiac death when the patient's 
risk of death due to a ventricular arrhythmia is deemed high and the risk from other causes of death is low. So they're saying that's intermediate value, the use of this device in this situation. What do they mean by intermediate value? This is how they define it. So high value is either um, better outcomes at a lower cost or uh, incremental cost effectiveness of less than $50,000 per quality gained. Intermediate value is 50 to 150,000. Low value is greater than 150,000. Now, in my view, these are reasonable thresholds, but not everyone would agree with them, certainly. Um, but they've sort of put their stake in the sand about what um, good value is. So let me wrap up and, and, uh, and then asking the question, should guideline developers consider costs? And Joanne gave a very nice explanation of when that makes sense and when it doesn't. Um, the rationale is in part that you can, you can affect such large resource expenditures with guidelines. It would certainly be nice to be able to do something about it. In the United States, there are considerable methodologic challenges for assessing value um, for interventions that are used in widely varying settings with widely varying costs and different people paying for different parts of the costs. And in the U.S., there are very different perspectives on value and how it should, um, how it should influence healthcare delivery. So. Um, we still have uh, um, a lot of questions to answer in the U.S. and we're uh, in, here in the U.K. You're much further ahead on this than, than we are, um, but um, I'll stop there and look forward to questions. <laughs>